OK, there's, so I just want to touch on one more argument. So the first argument uh, deals with protecting women right, who might sell their eggs. The other very different argument is that, no, 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 we're not concerned about the women who might sell their eggs. That's fine for them. If they think it's worth five or $10,000, good for them. We have no problem with that. The problem is it undermines human dignity. It's bad for the rest of us that live in society. If we let people sell their, uh, sell their eggs, um, then it's like selling their, it's like selling themselves, right? It's like if we were allowed, if, like if we allowed selling of children, that we're commodifying human beings, and that just that just reduces human dignity, and it's bad for all of us if we live in a society like that. And um, so here, I, I mean, I also find this argument unconvincing because I I just don't think that disembodied tissues are what's uh, the critical uh, locus of personhood. Right? I don't think selling a tissue is like selling a person. Um, people can, of course, disagree on that. Uh, also, I think that if we're talking about whether we prohibit compensation for research purposes, um, the sales for research are likely to have a small marginal effect on the social meaning that's attributed to uh, allowing people to sell um, their tissues or allowing women to sell eggs in particular. That if we allow egg sales for fertility purposes, that whatever the social meaning, whatever effect that has on society, uh, is going to have that effect on society. And whether or not we allow a few more people to sell eggs for medical research or not, is not going to affect the overall uh, social meaning. Okay. Um, so, so let's talk, so Bob asked about, about the law. So let's, let's talk about what the law is here about tissue sales. So um, I think Max, uh, he mentioned uh, organ transplants. So we have the Nor National Organ Transplant Act, which prohibits the sale of organs for, but only for transplantation purposes. Okay, so, so um, you cannot, you may not sell your kidneys to somebody who wants a transplant. But in fact, believe it or not, the National Organ Transplant Act does not prohibit you from selling your kidneys for medical research. If somebody wanted to buy your kidneys to do research on them, the law doesn't prohibit that. It's only specifically for transplants. Uh, there's um, a law called the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, uh, which has been adopted by every state, which prohibits selling tissues after you're dead. Okay, so. Uh, so it, it, uh, so it, it gives you the right to leave to uh, will your tissues or your body to science if you want, uh, and it says you can't you can't get paid for that. But it doesn't say anything about selling tissues while you're alive. It doesn't cover that at all. It's for it's, it deals with what happens to if you want your tissues treated a certain way after death. So there's no prohibition there. The only national law on the, uh, you know, that covers the whole country that's relevant is in the um, uh, NIH Revitalization Act of 1993, um, legislation was enacted that prohibits the sale of fetal tissue. Okay? So there is a federal law that says you can't buy or sell fetal tissues. And the idea here was uh, wanted to uh, make sure that no one was encouraged to have an abortion because they could get money by selling the fetal tissue. That's the only type of tissue that you may not sell for research purposes under federal law. Albert? You said you're not allowed to sell your tissues after you're dead. Could you like leave your organs or tissues and like your will, let's say, to your relatives who could then sell them? Mm -mm. They can't sell them either. <laughs> Good idea, but no. <laughs> OK, uh, now state laws. Okay. <clears throat> there are nine states that prohibit tissue sales for research purposes only, okay? And there are 13 that prohibit specifically embryo sales for research. Only Louisiana prohibits sales of eggs for all purposes, okay? So what that means is that in most jurisdictions, it's legal to buy and sell any tissue, including eggs, um, for research purposes. However, okay, that said, although it's legal to buy and sell tissues for research purposes in most jurisdictions, there's this odd thing, that the states where most of the stem cell research is done are the states that have put up these legislative barriers, like Massachusetts and like California. Okay, so in California, 
Um, oh, I'm sorry. So here, um, so the federal law also, by the way, if Congress, going back to the congressional view on stem cell research, if Congress had passed the Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act, uh, that law would have provided that no federal funding can be used for any embryonic stem cell research that is conducted using any eggs that were paid for. Okay? So, and I, again, I expect this is what the law is going to be under an Obama administration. So, so I expect to see some limitations on federal funding if any women are paid for their eggs. So that's going to be a deterrent, right, to even if there's no law preventing the sale of eggs. Researchers are not going to want to pay for eggs because then they're not going to be able to use any federal funding, if, if I'm right that this is going to be the, the federal law. Um, Proposition 71 in California that created the California $3 billion for stem cell research says in it that the governing body of the Regenerative Medicine um, Institute shall establish standards prohibiting compensation to research donors or participants. Okay? So if you want money from CIRM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, if you want a grant from CIRM to do stem cell research, you can't use any of that money to pay women for their eggs, or for that matter, anybody for any tissue. No paying for tissue with state money. Okay? You might think, okay, again, that's state money, right? But um, it doesn't prohibit researchers using private money from paying. But the legislature wasn't uh, happy with this. This wasn't sufficient. So in 2006, legislature of the state of California passed a new law, a new statute, says no, so no human oocytes, eggs, or embryo, so eggs or embryos, doesn't cover every tissue, but specific to eggs and embryos, shall be acquired, sold, offered for sale, received, or otherwise transferred for valuable consideration for the purposes of medical research. Okay? So <clears throat> if any of the women in the group, if you want to sell your eggs to someone who wants them for fertility treatment, Go crazy, right? Whatever you can get in the Daily Bruin, right? If you're, you know, if you have perfect SAT scores and you're 5'10 and you're an Olympic swimmer, put an ad in the Daily Bruin, ask for $80,000 for your eggs, good luck to you, okay? But if someone down the hall from Bob <coughs> wants to offer you $5,000 for your eggs so they can use them to do research on therapeutic cloning, <coughs> illegal, okay? Can't do it. So there's this distinction that's made between fertility and, um, and research uses, which is why I was kind of probing the people that voted for C. That's the choice that the legislature of California has made. Right? And so that's why I was probing for, uh, for reasons. Rose? What about embryos or like eggs that are left over from like IVF treatments mm -hmm. that had been paid for? Mm. Well, you're getting, you're, you're, you're getting ahead of the game a little bit, so hold on to that. That's a great question. We'll come to that in a minute. Max? Is there any limit on how much times a woman can donate eggs? For, well, for fertility, I know there is, but for research, is there? Um, no, I, I don't think there are any, there are no legal limits at all. I mean, there are some IVF clinics that have, you know, high ethical standards are going to limit the number of times that they will take a woman's eggs, but there's no, there's no legal regulation at all. So, not from that perspective. So, um, let's see. Um, now, let's say you live in a state, let's say, let's say you're doing research, stem cell research not in California and not in Massachusetts and not in Connecticut and not in New Jersey. You're doing research in a state that doesn't have a law that prohibits uh, payment for um, research eggs. Can you pay women for research eggs? Well, probably not from a practical perspective because the National Research Council has issued the following ethical guidelines. Okay? This is their, the National Research Council's view of what's ethical in research. No cash or in-kind payments for donating blastocysts. No cash or in-kind payments for donating eggs, no payments for sperm, or any other kind of somatic cells. Okay? Basically covers everything that stem cell researchers might want to use. 
can't pay for them. Now, why would a researcher care what the National Research Council thinks? Who cares what those people think? Um, just a bunch of uh, um, you know, just a bunch of academics who get together in Washington under the auspices of, the, of um, some quasi-government agency and just opine about what they think. Well, the reason it matters is because when you go to the IRB, the Institutional Research Board, to get approval for your project, and your project calls for paying women for eggs or for paying people for other tissues, they're going to say, your IRB is going to say, wait a second, that's unethical. Geez, the same old geezers that are making these ethical standards are the ones on the IRB. That's exactly right. Kayla? OK, so in that first statement up there, mm -hmm. um, that last phrase, in mm -hmm. excess of clinical mm -hmm. need for research purposes, mm -hmm. doesn't that then allow for donating blastocysts as long as there is a researcher who needs them? No. Um, it, I mean, you can donate them, but you can't I get... Mean, but, but does not allow for being paid for? Because it says, in, in excess of clinical need for research purposes. So as mm -hmm. long as there is someone doing research in need of blastocysts, you could be paid for them. No. But it's that's what opposite. it says. No. It's but not, that's what it I, says. I, no, I understand. I understand your reading of the language, but my reading is exactly the opposite. Um, it's the, the clause for research purposes. So, so read it this way. Um, uh, no cash or in-kind payments or in-kind payments may be provided for donating blastocysts for research purposes. Right, the in excess of clinical need uh, modifies blastocysts. So these are so they're saying if you have any blastocysts that are left over from your IVF treatment, right? You got IVF treatment, you've got a bunch of blastocysts, and you've got excess ones. You've got them le left over, uh, and you want to donate them for research purposes. You can't get cash or in-kind payments for them. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the wording is is somewhat confusing. It's, it's ambiguous. That's that's the right term. Yes, yes, yeah. That, I assure you, that's not what they mean, though. But, but too bad they didn't have you to edit the text before it went to press. I think that's a fair point. Um, OK, so um, <clears throat> okay, so now so here's where we stand. So we've got this, so we've got this strange uh, bifurcated system that unless you live in Louisiana, um, you're perfectly free to sell your eggs for fertility purposes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, but you can't sell them for research purposes in a number of states, including these four, where a lot of the research gets done. Okay. Um, and you're going to have trouble, if you're a researcher, you're going to have trouble getting IRB approval, even if you don't live in those states, to pay for, for research eggs. Okay. Um, the justifications, again, are, as I said before, coercion and anti-commodification. And by the way, kind of just as a side point here, how, does the, how do these laws get passed? Um, sort of what are the politics of these kind of laws? Because the law in California that got passed was passed unanimously by the state legislature. No negative votes. No negative votes. Uh, it's signed by the governor the next day. Right? Virtually no controversy. I wrote an op-ed piece opposing the law in the LA Times the day before. It was published a couple, day or two before uh, a vote was taken in one of the houses. And, um, it was persuasive enough to convince exactly this many legislators. Okay? This was not a controversial law, unanimously. Why is that? I think that there's this strange coming together of liberals and conservatives. Liberals don't like selling eggs because they think it coerces poor women. Conservatives don't like selling eggs because they think it's like selling part of a body, right? The, 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 the conservatives like the anti-commodification argument. Liberals like the coercion argument. Um, and so, uh, y so you get a situation where there's no constituency other than scientists. Scientists are the only constituency to oppose these laws. But, uh, but basically, both ends of the political spectrum seem to uh, favor them. OK. Now, What happens when you have this bifurcated system, right, where you say yes for fertility, no for research? So Rose uh, came up with a very, asked a very good question. And this is what spurred my discussion of this in the current article, because this is also something, this is something that happened last year. Last year, a company named Stemogen in San Diego um, 
published a paper that showed that they had almost accomplished somatic cell nuclear transfer using humans, using uh, human cells. They didn't quite do it. They, they created embryos using SCNT, but they couldn't keep the embryos alive long enough to extract stem cells from them, embryonic stem cells. So they, they didn't quite make it, but they came close. But what got most attention, the most attention, was not what they had done scientifically, but how could they have done it? Where'd they get the eggs? You need a bunch of eggs for this, and you can't pay women in California for eggs, right? And we know we got these people from Harvard running all over the world saying, we can't get a single woman to give us her eggs. So where did Stemogen get the eggs? Okay. So they did an end around that exploited this distinction between fertility and for research. So <clears throat> what they did was, working with a fertility clinic, they went to couples that were getting IVF and had procured eggs for IVF from an egg donor who had been paid, probably. They claimed that they don't actually know if the person had been paid or not, but, they, but they're happy to say, we assume sh that the woman was paid. We don't know for sure. We assume the woman was paid for her eggs. So they go to the, so, so the woman was paid for her eggs. And then they went, to, but they didn't ask the woman for eggs. They went to the couple that was getting the IVF treatment. And they told the couple, um, we know you have an egg donor coming in to provide eggs. And probably, because of the hormone treatment and the extraction, probably the clinic will be able to harvest about 20 eggs from her. And the clinic thinks that you only need 10 to 12 eggs to basically max out on your potential of conceiving through IVF. They don't really think you need to fertilize all 20 of those eggs. With sperm for IVF, they think 12 is more than enough. If your egg donor provides more than 12 eggs, will you give us the leftovers to use for research? People said, OK. Probably not all of them that they went to, but some, enough did. Enough agreed to that. And then they went to the, the women who were providing the eggs. And they said, can we have your permission that assuming it's OK with the, with the couple, they already said it's OK. Would it be OK with you if we use the extra eggs for research? And the women also gave their consent. They said, what do I care? I'm getting paid, right? Um, <clears throat> so they got the eggs right, through the couple that was, getting, that, was getting, that was using the eggs for, that was paying for the eggs for fertilization. The researchers got them, but the researchers didn't pay for them. So Rose, what do you think? Legal or illegal under California law? I'll give you the, I'll go back to show you the text of the, of the law here. Here we go. OK, Rose, what do you think? Legal or illegal, what they did? I'm going to say I'm going to say illegal, just because it's saying acquired in some way. I don't know. I hope it's legal, but <laughs> Any other people? Any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, guys. Michael, Albert. It says that the embryo sh uh, won't be acquired, sold, offered, uh, et cetera, et cetera, for the purpose of medical research. And it wasn't acquired for the purpose of medical research. It was just taken after the fact. So by the text of this, I would say that it's legal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Albert, what do you think? Yeah, I'd agree with Michael. Um, plus, they did it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming like, I didn't oh, read Oh, just because they did it, that doesn't prove yeah, anything. But I didn't read any article of like all these scientists going to jail for breaking this law, for stealing a bunch of eggs. So, Well, nobody accuses them of stealing them, right? The question is whether they violated this law, whether they, whether they illegally paid for eggs for the purpose of medical research. Kayla? I think that the fact that they informed the person who was donating and the couple who was receiving ahead of time pushes it towards the transferred for valuable consideration part mm -hmm. because 
it is um, been possible that um, either the IVF clinic would attempt to take more eggs than 12, if at all possible, because um, the woman, the the, don the person doing the donation might have, like, could, could ask them to, and so that's where you get in that gray area of the person knows that their eggs are going to go to research if there are extras, and so that money covers those eggs as well, and because they know ahead of time and aren't donating them after the fact, after it's done, they've been paid, and then they're not used, that goes into justifying to themselves to, to give them in the first place. So you think it, so, so just to make sure I understand, you think it depends, you think it would be legal if they, if Stemogen didn't approach anybody about this until after the eggs were extracted, it would be okay. But if they approach the people before the eggs are extracted, then it crosses the line. Yes. Okay. Stephen? I think the important distinction to be made is that the actions by Stemogen don't violate this law in, um, in relation to the legislative intent behind this law. If you look at why they passed it, mm -hmm. they passed it so that there wouldn't be the coercion. Mm -hmm. And that's that if they're approaching people who are already doing this mm -hmm. for other reasons besides medical research, then there's no coercion. You don't have mm -hmm. that element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have any points up in Davis, Faria? I think that the fact that they got consent makes it OK. No one said that they didn't really take it. They didn't really do it after they said no. You know, and it was already it's already the eggs are already there. Mm -hmm. and they're using it for research purposes. I don't think I don't think it's a problem. I don't think it's illegal at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, there's a difference of opinion on this. Um, uh, the uh, center for um, I always get this confused because the name is similar to other things. The the center I think it's called the Center for Genetics and Society in Oakland. There's a nonprofit group in Oakland. Um, they wrote on their website, they wrote that this violates, that this violated the California law. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I wrote, I wrote in this article that I guess uh, Bob distributed to you that was just published, I wrote that this is legal. Um, under, that's my opinion, it's legal under the California law. Um, although I like, I mean, I like Kayla's distinction. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I do not know exactly where in the process Stemogen stepped in. Um, I know it was after the couples that were getting the eggs had already made arrangements to pay whatever they were going to pay. Those arrangements, that, that contract had already been made with the donors before Stemogen got involved. I don't know if they got involved after the eggs were extracted or before the eggs were extracted. Um, so that, would be, that, that might be a relevant, a relevant fact. But I think this is, it's, it's still very much um, uh, up in the air. I mean, m m you know, my view is that um, the eggs were sold, okay, so the eggs were transferred for valuable consideration for the purpose of fertility treatment. Then they were given away for no consideration for the purpose of medical research, right? That's how I parse the, the statute. So I think Stemogen's okay. Um, by the way, just a tangential story about the academic world in a very odd thing. The, po the editor of this journal, that um, Jurometrics, which is, which is a journal of law and science, published out of Arizona State, the editor of this journal was very unhappy and very worried that he thought that the journal was going to get sued by Stemogen because my article raised the question of whether they had done something illegal, which I found very odd because my article defended them. Like my article raised the question and then said they had not done anything illegal. Anyway, he was quite nervous about that. But the lawyers. Yeah, a, a bad lawyers. <laughs> yeah, a bad lawyer. Um, in any event, um, so that's a side story. So, now, so let me just make one more comment about this question. So there is, I think it's hard to justify this distinction between, um, right here. okay, it's hard to justify this line, I think. If we're going to if we're going to prohibit sales for research, then it seems like we should prohibit them for fertility, right? That if if you're if you're moved by the coercion or the anti-modification argument, 
it seems to me like it should apply in either case. Right? If you're not moved by those arguments, then it shouldn't apply in either case. But to treat one one way and one the other way under the law seems to me very hard to defend. But that said, I will point out that there is one important distinction, or at least it may be important. It's a distinction you might care about. <clears throat> the women who are likely to donate for fertility purposes are not the same group as the women who are likely to donate for research purposes. Anybody know why? Julie, why? The, for research excludes any women, I would think, who are morally against research versus for fertility, they're not being, I mean, you said there's the quarter of Americans who always are against stem cell research. I would assume those, that quarter mm -hmm. who are women would never donate for research, whereas maybe a few of the, of the mm -hmm. more liberal, yeah. of those very conservative people might donate for fertility. Yeah, for so, right. So, so it might be true that there might be some women who, 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 don't, who are against uh, certain kinds of medical research. That's true, but, that, but that's not really the point I'm getting at. I, I'm thinking more in terms of if we want to protect women, right? If we think that it's important to protect women from coercion, um, there might be a difference in the type of women who uh, who fall into one category or the other. What is, uh, Thomas. Well, like, if, um, if they're being donated for fertility, they've already been picked by a couple to like represent their egg, so they're probably middle class and healthy and you know all that stuff. Well, if they're donating for research, they're probably more likely to be poor and probably not middle class. Absolutely, absolutely right. So there, there is without a doubt, without a doubt there is a class uh, difference and uh, on average, right? Not, not, not going to be true for everybody, but on average, there's going to be a class difference and there's going to be a racial difference on average, Ra race or ethnicity uh, difference. That um, who donates for fertility treatment? Mostly white women, not entirely, right? Mostly white, mostly not lower class, mostly middle class, white, a lot of, a lot of time college students, okay? Or slightly, slightly older than college students. Why are those the donors? Because for exactly the reason that Thomas said is that the people that are hiring donors, right, the people that are looking for egg donors tend to be middle to upper class and they tend to be overwhelmingly white. Right? Now again, not every, not every couple, but mostly white and almost all middle to upper class. They tend to want egg donors who look like them and have a similar background to them. Again, not always, not in 100% of cases, but most of the time. Okay? So the women who you might think, or at least some people might think, are the most vulnerable to exploitation are not likely to be paid for fertility eggs. Okay? Whereas if researchers are allowed to pay for eggs, presumably researchers don't care at all what the women look like and what their background is. They want eggs from anyone, and presumably they want their research grants to stretch as far as possible. So presumably they're going to want to get eggs from whoever, whoever will sell them for the least amount of money. And of course that's going to be, right, just almost, uh, you know, almost by definition, it's going to tend to be poorer women. Right? If, you, you know, if you think, if the women in this room who have, you know, I don't know what your, what the, your kind of uh, uh, a financial situation your family is in, but you all have a lot of opportunities, right? You're going to, you're getting a degree from a good school, you're smart, you're accomplished. So if you think, some of you may or may not think, gee, if I could get $80,000 to sell my eggs, would I do it? Well, maybe that would be tempting, right? Some of you might think that. But if I, but probably none of you are going to raise your hand if I say, if I say, I need eggs for research and I'll pay you $500. Okay, raise your hand if you want in on this. My guess is none of you are, gonna, are interested in this at all. But very poor women with very few options, they might be willing, right? And so those are probably going to be the people, if we just allowed a market for research eggs, those are going to be the donors, right? So I think a lot of people that consider themselves to be good liberals can justify this distinction by saying, look, the women that need the most protection need it from researchers, 
right? And that the, fertil the market for fertility eggs will ensure that the most vulnerable women are not coerced or exploited because people that are buying fertility eggs don't want eggs from those women. Okay, now, to me, this is a horribly classist argument, right? It's suggesting that, it's suggesting that um, white middle class college women don't need to be protected from their own bad decisions, but poor, largely minority women do need to be protected from making bad decisions. So I find this to be an offensive kind of a, kind of a distinction, and, and also one that there, I, don't, I don't know of any data that suggests that this is true, right? That anybody who would make a choice to sell their eggs, is, it's making, making a trade-off. And to say that some women would be able to make that trade-off and we trust them to make the best trade-off for them, but other women we don't. I don't, I don't know of any, uh, of any established basis for that distinction, but I think that distinction is lurking here. Um, okay, anyway. Any, any comments on, on this uh, issue? Before? Then we're going to move on to something else, but Jessica, what do you think? I was thinking that it's just a matter of who's being coerced. Um, so, is the argument just that like whoever's financial situation is worse, they just think that there's a greater chance of them being coerced into the action? Um, it's not necessarily like um, classes. Well, well, it's true, but but um, uh, so these people, so so if so, you might think that uh, it's going to be poor people, poor women that are going to be coerced um, if. Researcher offering, researcher, researchers are offering $1,000, right, or as, as little as they can get away with offering. It's going to be poor women that are going to feel like they have to do it because they need the money. For fertility, the price is going to be higher because, they're not, because you're not going to be able to get the kind of women that you want for fertility treatment if you're only offering $500 or $1,000. So the price is going to go higher. So... <clears throat> Turns out that, that a lot of college students are willing to do it for six to eight thousand dollars. Okay, so in that sense, they're being coerced. But it seems like the implicit distinction that's being made is that we trust the white middle class college women to make a reasonable decision, whereas we don't trust poor women. I mean, I think that's implicitly what's going on here. So, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, it's a different group is going to be coerced. I think that's, that's right. But, but why do we think it's more coercive or more problematic in one case but not the other is my, is my question. OK. So, um, yeah, Albert. Um, even if they are being coerced, I guess in a sense, uh, like if all of this is true, even though it's like based on really nothing, um, I don't really see why that's a problem. Like, they might still be better off without their eggs and with a thousand dollars than with their eggs without the thousand dollars that they might need for food. So, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, I, I, that's why that's why I think the, that coercion is not. I, that's why I think that this argument is 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 wrong. That that's what's what's one person's coercion is another person's opportunity. Yeah. Um, and we don't expect um, t we don't expect people that uh, work in jobs that are particularly dangerous, for example. Um, to, uh, if, if a job is particularly dangerous, we tend to have the, the feeling that maybe the people that do it ought to be paid more. We don't think that coal miners ought to be paid nothing. right? Say so it's a dangerous job. Well, we shouldn't allow coal mines to pay miners because they're coercing people, mostly poor people, without other good opportunities, right? Without college educations, mostly without even high school educations, right? They're coercing people without good opportunities to take these dirty and dangerous jobs. So we could avoid the coercion if we just didn't allow coal miners to get paid. We say only altruists are allowed to be coal miners. But you know, we usually think exactly the opposite. Why do we think that egg donors should have to be altruists um, rather than thinking exactly the opposite, that they should be paid a lot of money? If they're going to provide a resource that's good for society, they're going to bear all the burden 
and society in general is going to get the benefit, get to share in the benefit, why shouldn't we pay them more money, not less? I mean, who booed when President Obama the other night said he's going to, in his budget, he's going to call for increasing the pay of soldiers, right? Who said, that's horrible. Do you know how coercive that is? Right? More people are going to feel like they have no choice but to join the army and get shot at because pay is going up. Right? Well, I, to me, it's the same argument. You know, but does that mean we should pay soldiers less? Because we, we only want people to be soldiers if they don't care at all about money so they don't feel coerced. Or we should pay them more because they're doing a dirty and dangerous job that we all benefit from. Bob, do we have a, a few more minutes for yeah, patents? I think so. Okay. <coughs> All right. Okay. Um, so just a couple of basic points, because I know you haven't really talked about uh, patent uh, law yet. So if you have a patent for something, it provides you with a 20-year monopoly on using that technology. Uh, you have the right to prevent other people from using whatever it is that you have patented. Um, does not provide you with an affirmative right to sell it or to market it. That's a different question. Okay? So if you have a patent on a drug, for example, that doesn't mean that you can sell it. You still need to get approval from the FDA before you're allowed to sell it. But even if you don't have any approval from the FDA, if you have a patent, you can stop somebody else from selling it or even from using it. Okay? Um, in order to qualify for a patent, here are the basic requirements. Okay. It's got to be an invention. It's got to have utility. That means it has to be something that has some useful purpose. Right. You have to be able to describe in your patent application what it's good for. Although, as Bob will probably talk about next, uh, next week, the requirements <laughs> seem to be pretty low in this department. Um, in the biomedical field, although there are, I think they might be stiffening up just a little bit these days. Um, it has to be novel. That is, it has to be something new, right? It has to be a new invention, not something somebody's already done. It has to be non-obvious, okay? So if it was obvious, you were the first person to do it, so it's, it's, maybe it's new, but it was obvious, then you can't get a patent. And there's also an enablement requirement, which means you have to describe how to create this thing, this invention, in a way that other people who are reading your patent could then create your invention. They could mimic it. Right? So this is considered to be sort of a quid pro quo or a trade-off. We give you a patent. In return, you have to teach the rest of the world how to do it. Okay? So you give us, you tell us how to do it, you tell us how the technology is done, you get to use it exclusively for 20 years. After that, we all get to benefit. Okay. Um, if you get a patent, you file for a patent with the US Patent and Trademark Office. You file an application, you describe your invention, you ask for a patent. If they give you a patent, that's presumptively valid, but not definitely. Okay. Um, there are ways that a patent that's once issued can be challenged and it can be overturned by the Patent and Trademark Office itself or by the federal courts. Okay. So if your patent was, if, the, if you convince them to give you a patent, but an appeals board of the Patent Office or a court determines that you didn't actually meet all those requirements, you convince them that you did. You convince some patent office employee that you met all those requirements, an examiner, but you didn't really. They can take your patent away. Okay. So that's going to be important in our discussion here. Okay. So relevance to stem cells. <clears throat> in 1994, James, Jamie Thompson's group at the University of Wisconsin produced the first primate embryonic stem cell lines. And then four years later, they produced the first human embryonic stem cell lines. And they filed for a series of patents as a result. They were granted three patents. They're all related, but there are technically three different patents for primate embryonic stem cells. They're what's called composition of matter claims. You can get a patent on a thing 
or on a process. They got patents on the thing, okay? composition of matter. And here's what they claim patent protection for. Human embryonic stem cells that remain stable and undifferentiated in culture for at least one year. Okay. That's what they claim. That, that composition of matter, that petri dish full of embryonic stem cells that stayed in that state for one year, that's what they claimed ownership over. Okay. They also have process claims. Okay. So secondarily, they also claimed patent protection for the way they did it. But that's not their primary claim. The primary claim is for the thing. They now claim ownership over all human embryonic stem cell lines. Okay. Now, they actually created five in their laboratory, five different cell lines. But they don't claim, and I don't think anyone would have, no one would have challenged them or no one would be concerned if they said, we own these five lines of stem cells, and you can't use them without our permission because how would you get them anyway? You, you can only get them if, if they'll send you some of the cells. Right? They're in, they've got them in their test tubes, in their lab. Okay? But they said, no, no, no. We don't just own these five lines. We own all human embryonic stem cell lines. You want to use, you want to make your own embryonic stem cell lines? You got to get permission from us, from the University of Wisconsin. Regardless of their genotype, regardless of what culture you use to keep the things alive, regardless of who makes them. Okay. okay, so question. What which of the following views of human embryonic stem cells most closely reflects your own? Okay. A, the creators of the first stem cell lines, the Wisconsin folks, should not be entitled to patent protection. The technology should be freely available for anyone to use. B, the creators of these lines should be entitled to patent their specific method of creating them. But other scientists should be permitted to create other embryonic stem cell lines as long as they use a different process or a different method of doing it. Or C. They should be entitled to patent all human embryonic stem cell lines such that no other scientist may create such cell lines without negotiating permission from the Wisconsin folks. The question is whether B is a process that's not obvious from the first process. Well, it does get, it does get messy. Yeah. <laughs> does like get a totally messy. different process. Totally different, right. In other words, let's say someone else had a totally different, so B is, let's say someone else had a totally different way of making stem cell lines. They got the cells out of the inner cell mass of the embryo using a different method, and they had a different chemical um, uh, mixture that they kept the cells in. OK. We'll go over a lot of this next week. Huh. All right. OK. So most of you think that they should be able to get a process patent, but not a Composition of matter patent is essentially what this what the B is. Um, a few of you think that they should be able to patent all stem cells, and nobody thinks they shouldn't be entitled to any patent protection. Now I find that the most interesting thing here. Okay, so I can call on anybody because none of you chose A. Why should they be able to get a patent on? Embryonic stem cells, these things that are in our bodies. Michael, why Michael. do you want to give somebody ownership of that? Well, you brought up the concept before with getting eggs from women. And if you're going to get an egg from a woman and you don't pay her, she's not going to do it. By that yeah. same concept, why would an investor, especially in a country where we can't have government funding, you know, paying for these experiments, why would a private investor want to invest in something where there's no chance of making money off of it because there's no patent. 
I mean, if we live in a capitalist society, we have to obey capitalist rules. But let me ask you another and a follow-up question, Michael. Are the embryonic stem cells that are in Jamie Thompson's Petri dish sprinkled with these chemicals and stuff the same as the inner cell mass in the blastocyst? No. I mean... Yes, in the sense that they're both embryonic stem cells. They have stem to cells. be manipulated in order to put them in the Petri dish. Yes. So someone had to use what's called the hands of man. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get... I'm sorry. Well, I'm we'll, we'll talk. That's a very important distinction. I'm not understanding, though, where the question is being You'll posed. see on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, important question, and I think a question in some ways uh, there's with, without an answer. Um, it doesn't matter, though. But my, my, Michael, you're right. It doesn't matter to to your point because you think that they're entitled anyway. Like, like you want to give them a patent, uh, regardless of whether it's the same thing that's in a person's body or not, because for purely an incentive reason. If we don't give people a patent for these things, nobody's going to create them. And of course, that is the reason for patents, right? The reason is to provide encouragement to people to uh, do things that are going to require time or money or energy. If anybody could just copy their, their work, then why would anyone spend the, the money to do it originally? And I think Michael makes a very nice, subtle point that you might think, I think one, one, prob one reasoning trap you might fall into is you might think, Jamie Thompson is a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin. And he probably would do the work anyway, because he's a scientist. And that's what he does. And he gets paid by the University of Wisconsin to be a scientist. And he gets tenure by being a good scientist and publishing his results. He's got lots of incentives to do the work. But it's not just about him, that his work required a lot of funding. Right? It's not just, if he could have done it all by himself, maybe we would say, Jamie Thompson probably, arguably. You know, he doesn't need any patent protection. Like, I, write, I wrote this book. right? Um, I certainly didn't need copyright protection to write the book. I would have written the book anyway. Why? Because that's what I get paid by UCLA to do. Right? It's my job. Um, so I, I, don't need any, I don't need intellectual property protection to write a book or to write an article. Um, and probably Jamie Thompson doesn't need it anyway. But the company Geron gave him millions and millions of dollars in funding to make this possible. I can write this book with access to a library and a computer. I don't need a huge amount of capital to write the book. Thompson needs a lot of capital in order to develop human embryonic stem cells. No capital, no research. Okay. Um, now, Michael, let me just ask you, though. This was a strange situation in that because we have this strange fixation with embryos in this country, well, I should, I should remove the, let me, let me take that back and not say strange. Okay? We're very concerned with embryos, and we have these special rules for embryos. So Thompson needed private funding. But f most basic science in this country is funded with government, federal government money. So if Thompson had been able to fund this project with grants from the federal government, we still want to give them a patent? Yes, because science, I mean, we can't rely on the federal government to fund every outlet and avenue of science that's going to happen. That destroys the whole point of the capitalist society in which we live. Yeah, but what if we just say, if you take money from the federal government, you're not eligible for a patent. If you don't, have to, if you don't need federal, if you don't take government money, then you can patent it. That just, it seems almost redundant when you say that, to say that the second you take a piece of government money, you can't make money off of what you've made, because it still destroys the whole reason to invest and the whole reason. I mean, one cent of government funding then could effectively destroy research, because they suddenly couldn't accept anything other than that one cent of granted federal funding. OK. Yeah, but there's also this, this thing called the Bayh-Dole Act, and the, which we'll talk about in the Bayh-Dole Act says that you can, universities can take money from the federal government and then license that technology of the inventions from federal funded research. And that's been very, very important actually for pursuing and facilitating biomedical research because this is the way in which the recombinant DNA patent, which is a process patent, was licensed 
to many different companies and use for all the great things we've talked about. So we'll get into this stuff. Yeah, so if, if, in fact, let me just, let me just make that point a, a, a little bit here, that it's, it's useful to think about patents to distinguish between two incentives, the incentive to innovate and the incentive to commercialize. Okay? So if the government is funding the basic research, then one might argue that you don't really need to give scientists patents on their government-funded research in order to give them the incentive to innovate. But there's also this question about whether anyone has the incentive to commercialize the invention. So <clears throat> if I invent a, um, I don't know, let's just make something simple. Let's say I invent a car, okay, or I invent a new kind of, uh, I, I invent a new kind of engine for a car that you know, will get incredible mileage or won't need to use gasoline or something you know, fabulous. Okay. There's one, what's going to give me the incentive to come up with that innovation? That's one question. But let's say the government's giving me all the, all the, paying for all the research. So then arguably, I don't really need a patent in order to have the incentive to, to invent the engine. But how is it going to get mass produced and commercialized? I've got to find somebody. If I'm a scientist at a university working in a lab, I can't just produce a million of these engines. I've got to get a company to invest in a man to invest in building a factory to make to start churning these things out. And it's going to be harder for me to convince somebody to do that if I don't have a patent. If I have a patent, I can license the right to Bob to build these things. And he knows no one can copy him, right? Whereas if I don't have that patent, if Bob invests a billion dollars in building this big manufacturing operation, uh, and Hiromi can just copy him and start selling them for a dollar cheaper, I might not be able to get Bob to be willing to make the investment. Okay? So, so we have to think sort of the incentive to innovate and the incentive to commercialize both. Um, on the other side, though, here's the problem. Patents can deter secondary inventions. Okay? So that is, if we give Jamie Thompson a monopoly on stem cells, then that means somebody that wants to create a cure for Parkinson's disease, they have to pay him in order to be able to use stem cells to do that. And that can deter that secondary inventor from making a necessary improvement. Right? Now, economic theory would suggest that, a market, that the market system should avoid market failure. That if I've got an idea for how to make this, um, if, I, if I've got an idea for taking Thompson stem cells and creating a cure for Parkinson's disease, and I think I'm going to be able to, this is going to be a billion dollar innovation, my cure for Parkinson's disease, I ought to be able to negotiate a deal with Thompson. I give him half a billion dollars for the license, right, to use his patent. And then we're both happy, right? He gets a lot of money and I get a lot of money. So we shouldn't have the fact that he has a patent deter me from making a secondary innovation in terms of theory. But in terms of reality, there are a lot of problems. Okay? Oftentimes, markets fail to efficiently allocate this, these patent rights to what are sometimes called downstream inventors or secondary inventors okay? because it's very costly to try to negotiate this pat these patents. Um, I, as the secondary inventor, I might be very risk averse. I don't know. If I, pay, if I pay Thompson a half a billion dollars for the right to use his patent, and then my invention is, doesn't work, I'm out half a billion dollars, right? So, and then, most importantly, perhaps, there's a big problem, I think, in that people have different estimates of a patent's value. Right? So I think, OK, I have a chance of, 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 of coming up with this, in, with this extension uh, of, an in, of a primary innovation. And I think, maybe I'll make $100,000 with this invention. And I go to the primary inventor, and I tell him what I want to do. And he says, that's a, mil that's, a, that's a million dollar invention. And so he wants me to pay him half a million dollars. And I say, I'm only going to make $100,000 on this. And he says, no, I think you're going you're to make a lot more than $100,000. You're trying to lowball me. And I say, no, really, I don't think I'm going to make more than $100,000 on this. 
Well, we could easily, you could easily see how we are not able to reach an agreement for me to bargain to use the patent. So you have to sort of balance the cons against the pros when you're thinking about patents. OK. Um, so I mean, the real trick to good patent policy is to adjust the breadth of the patents, right? what you're going to give patents for and how broadly they're, uh, you're going to give the patents for. To provide, you want to provide enough incentive for the primary inventor to invent the thing, but you also want to have enough, in, uh, have them be limited so it doesn't unduly restrict secondary inventors from building on the primary invention and creating things that are even better. And that's a, that's a difficult balance in practice, right? In theory, you can see how it ought to work, but in practice, finding that balance uh, is difficult. And how the law tries to find this balance in practice is it uses these various legal categories right, to decide whether something is entitled to patent protection. Okay. So um, there are a lot of ways that we might challenge, a lot of legal ways that we might challenge the wharf patents. Um, and, um, we're actually kind of running short on time, so I'm not going to go through all of these uh, methods. I'll leave the product of nature method for Bob to talk about next week. I don't want to steal all of his thunder. Um, <clears throat> this is what the question uh, Bob was getting at when he asked Michael, do you think that they're the same thing inside the body as outside the body? One limitation of the, the, of the patent law is you can only get, uh, you, cannot, you cannot get a patent for something that's a product of nature. So, if you go into a mine, right, and you dig out uh, a chunk of gold out of the mine, and you, said, you say, this is great. People are going to love this stuff. Right? I'm going to file for a patent on gold. <laughs> and now anybody that wants to dig gold out of a mine is going to have to pay me for the right to do it. Okay? No, you'll be denied. Okay? Because the patent office will say, no, that's a product of nature. So technically, it's not an invention under the Patent Act. It's a discovery. You can't get a patent for a discovery. You just find a piece of gold, you can't get patent on, a patent on it. Okay? It's got to be an invention. So let's say it's not an invention, it's a product of nature. So that's one question in the, in the stem cell context, right? Um, did Thompson just discover something that's a product of nature, like a miner who chips a hunk of gold out of the wall of a mine? Right? Or did he invent something new? Right? So that's a, big, that's a big question. This has actually not been litigated. Okay? Nobody's challenged his patents on these grounds. Um, but it could be. And there we could talk about why nobody's challenged them. It's a complicated question. But probably because the technology, it hasn't, nobody's been able to make enough money on the technology yet to make it worthwhile to challenge, uh, to challenge the patents. Because um, it's very expensive to litigate patents. Now, one thing that it's less expensive to do is to go to back to the patent office and appeal the decision of the patent examiner within the patent office. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to put on a big case in court with lots of witnesses. You just go back to the patent office and you, and you say, we think that you got it wrong. Would you please take another look at this patent? The problem with that kind of a challenge is there are only certain limited number of arguments you can make in that type of a challenge. You can't make the product of nature argument to the patent office. But what you can make to the patent office is the non-obviousness challenge. Okay. That is, you can go back to the patent office and you can say, we think you got it wrong because we think that this was actually an obvious invention. And a nonprofit group called the Public Patent Foundation did just this. They challenged the grant of these patents on the grounds that they failed the non-obviousness requirement. That is, what Thompson did was obvious. Okay, so I'm going to buzz through some things here. Okay. And again, we're going to go over all of this. So I'm just going to talk about this. Have it on your final oral exam. So we're just going to talk about this one particular challenge of the stem cell patents. <clears throat> so here's the argument, OK? Here's the argument that they made. 
By the way, who kind of gasped here? Just say when I said that they said his, uh, what he did was obvious. Who kind of, okay, why? What, why don't you think, what, why, what makes you think it's not obvious? Christopher, why is it not obvious? I wouldn't have it. You wouldn't have thought of it, uh-huh. No, uh -huh. I wouldn't have thought okay. of it. Good, good. So me. one question is, so one question is, well, what's the standard, right? What's the standard? Does it mean that somebody, that, does somebody in this classroom would have had to be able to do it, right? No, it's not that, not that standard. No, not that standard. Um, Here's the, legal, here's the legal standard. It would have had to have been obvious to someone who is ordinarily skilled in the art. Okay? So the first question that has to be asked is, what type of person would be ordinarily skilled in the art? So let's assume that in this, in this case, just for simplicity, let's assume that it would have had to be obvious to someone who has uh, a PhD in what would they have a PhD in, Bob? Molecular biology? Developmental biology. D developmental biology. Okay. So they have to have a PhD in some kind of related field, and they have to be engaged in this general type of research. Okay. They don't have to be doing. They don't have to be a clone of Jamie Thompson, obviously, but they have to be in that general field. Okay. <laughs> so the fact that Christopher wouldn't have thought of it, that's not going to be the test. It's going to be someone who's ordinarily skilled in the art. So. Um, <clears throat> Here's their argument. Okay. Uh, they, the, the opponents of this, the Public Patent Foundation, and they're backed up by Gene Loring, who's a well-known stem cell researcher at the Burnham Institute at UCSD, and Doug Melton, who's maybe the most famous stem cell researcher at Harvard. Uh, they filed affidavits in support of this argument that what Thompson did was obvious. Okay. They said all Thompson did was he used the method, the mouse method, the method of creating embryonic stem cell lines from mice, which has been well known in the literature, right? There, it's been published how to do it since 1991. Okay? We've known, we knew for 13 years before Thompson did anything, we knew how to do this in, how to do this in mice, and all Thompson did was he used the mice method on human embryos. Anybody who's ordinarily skilled in the art could have done it. Okay. Okay. Obvious to an ordinarily skilled researcher. Patent office ultimately upholds the patents. Okay. Says they weren't obvious. Now, when this dispute was going on, and I talked to Jean Loring about this, and I said, she was telling me, T Thompson, he didn't do anything inventive. He just used the mouse method. And I said, yeah, well, if you're so brilliant, how come you didn't do it before him? Look how famous you could have been. And by the way, how come nobody else did it for 13 years? Between 1991, when they did it with mice, and 19... In, uh, I'm sorry, 1981 when they did it with mice, and 1994 when Thompson did it with monkeys, how come nobody else did it? And then 1998 when he did it with humans, how come nobody else did it, if it's so easy? Anybody know the, an you know the answer? Well, the researchers could have been afraid of ethical issues that could have been brought up by it. Mm -hmm. Right, maybe they would have been, they were, too, they were too chicken to try. Could be, but no, that's not the answer. Anybody else know the answer? Anyone else want to guess? Kayla? Possibly they couldn't get funding. Um, uh, possible, yes. Um, didn't have the money. That's part of it. I think that's part of the answer, but not the full answer. Not the primary answer that, they, that Loring and Melton give anyway. The answer they say they say, nobody else did it because nobody else could get embryos. That was what Thompson, they claim that what Thompson was really good, good at was getting money, yes, and getting an IVF clinic to give him some embryos. Nobody else could get embryos, to, human embryos to work with. Okay. Um, so now, I thought, I, I just didn't believe this. Right? I thought there might be something to that, but I said, he's got to have done something different. And I read the patents, and I read the articles about the mice. But I'm not a scientist, right? 
I said, there's got to be something different about what he did than what the mice people did. And when the Public Patent Foundation challenged the patents, I thought, and now Worf is going to tell us exactly what Thompson did that was different, right? Because that's their obvious defense, right? They say, no, 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 we didn't just copy the mice method. We made these very subtle changes that were actually critical. Um, but they didn't do it in their brief. They didn't claim that they had done anything different than the mouse method. So I assume that Loring and Melton are right, that he didn't do anything different than the mouse method because they had lots of opportunity and lots of incentive to explain to the patent office exactly what was different about their approach, and they didn't do it. Instead, they said <clears throat> that, yes, they used the mouse method, but it wasn't obvious to use the mouse method because other people had tried to use the mouse method on other species and it had failed. So an ordinarily skilled person in the art would not have used the mouse method. And Thompson was inventive by using the mouse method on the human embryos. Uh, and essentially, the patent office upheld the patents on this grounds, that they said, here is the legal requirement. Um, <clears throat> in order for something to be obvious, it's not enough that it be obvious to try something. Obvious to try is not sufficient. you must have had a reasonable expectation of success in trying something in order for it to be an obvious innovation. And because so many people had had trouble using the mouse method on other species of animals, it might have been obvious to try it, but there wasn't a reasonable expectation of success. Um, so, Really, the broader issue here is how strictly should the obviousness requirement be interpreted? And um, <clears throat> the patent office decision here is it's a difficult and a questionable decision because just the year before, the US Supreme Court issued a decision in a case called KSR versus Teleflex that basically, in a different context, it didn't have anything to do with biomedical research. It had to do with the putting two inventions together to create a new gas pedal. Okay? So it was a different context. But the Supreme Court said that the lower courts have been too strict with the non-obviousness requirement. That Many more things are actually should be considered obvious than the lower courts have been and the patent office have been ruling. And they said, here, the Supreme Court said, here's what the test should be. Is the question is, would we have gotten this invention in the ordinary course of business if it hadn't been for the incentive of a patent? Because if an ordinarily skilled person, right? Remember the ordinarily skilled person in the art. If the ordinarily skilled person in the art, in the ordinary course of business, would have come up with this innovation, we don't want to be awarding patent monopolies for it. We only want to award patents if the ordinarily skilled person in the art would not have come up with it in the ordinary course of business. That is, there was some exceptional inventive aspect that was necessary here. So, under that standard, do the stem cell patents qualify? Right? Would an ordinarily skilled person in the art have come up with it without the incentive of a patent? Tough question, I think. Michael, what do you think? Well, you said it yourself that in 13 years, no one did it. So I'd say that 13 years is enough time for an ordinary course to occur. So mm -hmm. after 13 years, he 
not invented in a new way, but mm -hmm. uh, used a new application of an old technique mm -hmm. that resulted in novelty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kayla? Um, on that, with regard to the time period, you could argue that over the course of that time period, the method was used on other um, on other species, like in preparation for like evolving to that to that next level of study. Mm -hmm. I, I think that mm -hmm. um, that it definitely would have occurred in the ordinary course because the ordinary course of genetic um, research in genetic engineering has, in, has so far been, okay, we tested on animals, on like mice, and we tested on fish, and, we test, and then we tested on primates, mm -hmm. and then we tested on humans. Like that's the way it goes. So eventually a method would have been tested on humanity. The, so um, yeah, go ahead, Julie. Yeah, I'll let you guys get in here because I think we got about three more minutes. So I'm confused by what you're saying with ordinary that that was the ordinary course because I don't see why those experiments on other animals wouldn't have had the incentive of a patent. If they had gotten a successful embryonic stem cell from any other species, why wouldn't they have applied for a patent? Uh, they would have. They would have, but the question is, would they have gotten? You know, would they have gotten one? I don't. I don't know. If there hadn't been, it's not clear in the decision how critical the failures in other animals were. Right? So if the very first animal that they had tried it on had been you know, a cow, had been successful, or a sheep had been successful, would they have qualified for a patent on that? Um, I don't know. Or, if the, or would it have been obvious? Don't know the answer. These are the hard questions. Um, I think this is an extremely hard question. I think that the patent office, um, I think that their reasoning is flawed because they relied on the pre-existing standards uh, and did not fully take account of the broader, uh, looser, st or um, the US Supreme Court in KSR versus Teleflex basically told the patent office, you're issuing too many patents, okay? You got more things are obvious than you're finding to be obvious. And you're giving out too many patents, you need to cut back. And I don't think the patent office took that instruction into account here. Um, but I still think it's a very, very close and difficult case. And if you want to know, if you want to know where I come out at the end of the day, you can read the last few pages of the article that uh, that Bob uh, submitted to you, um, gave to you. Thank you um, so much for your attention. You've been uh, you really stuck in there for a long time. And thanks for having me. That was so great, Russell. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah.